Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Robert Hunter from the uh, Center for Transatlantic Relations. Uh, we're very fortunate this morning to, to have a, uh, one of the top officials of the Pentagon here to give us a particular uh, perspective. I have to start immediately by qualifying that uh, the title of the book, A Transatlantic Pivot to Asia, uh, I will say for the record, he may contradict me, the word pivot doesn't come from the Defense Department, it comes from <clears throat> other places in the government. Uh, the Pentagon says rebalance, which uh, I think is a more appropriate title. But if you're a basketball player, pivot means you have to have your foot solidly planted someplace, uh, and then you can move one way, you can move another way. Uh, my own personal judgment is that place you have to have your foot is in the Atlantic region. Uh, we've seen this uh, in terms of the way the Allies work with us. We, we know, for example, that the Allies, all 28 of them, went with us to Afghanistan, not really because they were worried about Al-Qaeda or Taliban coming to, uh, uh, to downtown uh, Brussels, although they may have offices there. I don't know. Everybody else does. Uh, but really because they wanted to make sure we remained a European power pinned to Europe, and especially to deal with Russia. Uh, and this is payoff time. So uh, in terms of getting allies to be engaged with us in places like the Middle East uh, and the Far East, et cetera, uh, our demonstrating uh, that we continue to hew to the fundamental grand strategy that we adopted in 1917 as second only to defense of the homeland still uh, applies, that is, to prevent the domination of the continent by regional hegemon and working out whatever is happening with regard to Ukraine and elsewhere with regard to Russia now becomes a fundamental task for American leadership if we're going to be able to do other things. Uh, we have uh, nobody better who could talk about uh, the security dimensions of this uh, in the broadest sense of the term as uh, Derek Cholet, who is the Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs, known in this town as ISA. He's also the principal advisor of the Under Secretary of Defense and Secretary on international security, strategy, and policy related to the nations and international organizations of Europe, uh, NATO, Middle East, Africa, Western Hemisphere. Uh, what part of the world he doesn't have isn't worth, uh, worth talking about, if I can say that. Uh, prior to that, he was the strategist in the White House. Uh, before that, he was principal deputy director of policy planning at state. Um, he has served in uh, more institutions in this town, think tanks and the like, and if he hasn't, they're not worth being at. Uh, CSIS is one of them, so I haven't insulted our host today. Uh, he's also written a lot of books, speechwriter, advisor to Richard Holbrook, uh, uh, to uh, Secretary of State uh, Talbot, uh, foreign policy advisor to uh, John Edwards in one of the campaigns, uh, the 2004 Kerry Edwards campaign, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we couldn't ask for anybody better to uh, tell us this morning about uh, what we ought to think and where we ought to go. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you very much for sharing your wisdom with us. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. Um, thanks all of you for being here. Hans, congratulations to you and your colleagues uh, on this terrific book. I had an opportunity last night to, to read a couple of the chapters, uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's a very important contribution on uh, an effort that has been an important part of the rebalance, or the pivot, depending on where you sit, uh, which is the, the effort to engage our European partners uh, on Asia issues. Um, and there's a lot of really good ideas uh, in this book. Uh, as many of you know, serving in government is an exercise in depleting your inter intellectual capital. Uh, and it's books like this that give people like me who can barely think about what I'm doing in the next hour or so uh, the ideas and the, the insights uh, that can help us forge a, a way forward. I want to also um, give thanks uh, to Ambassador Hunter, Robert Hunter, uh, who was, I think, the longest serving U.S. ambassador to NATO. Um, and he served there during a pivotal time, and it's fitting uh, to be with him this week on the 15th anniversary, we're celebrating the 15th anniversary of the first round of NATO enlargement, and he played a very key role uh, 20 years ago in what was then the big strategic move uh, of, of a U.S. administration, which was uh, redefining uh, the transatlantic alliance in the post-Cold War era and the partnership for peace, and of course, uh, leading to enlargement. So I'm very glad to be here. I know it's an impressive 
group of folks who are speaking with you. My colleague, Danny Russell, uh, spoke with you uh, earlier today. Um, it's, it's fitting for me to be here in some ways because I cover, as, as the ambassador said, I cover every part of the world in my job at the Pentagon except for Asia. Um, and uh, so I'm well aware of the stresses and the anxieties that uh, have been uh, sparked in, in other parts of the world, particularly in Europe, uh, by the, the articulation of our rebalancing strategy. And, but I could say then clearly and authoritatively uh, from where I sit at the Pentagon as someone who wakes up every day thinking about uh, our defense relationships in Europe and the Middle East and Africa and Latin America, that the fact that we have been executing this strategic move over several years of rebalancing to Asia in no way means that we pay less attention uh, to the challenges and problems and opportunities uh, of the rest of the world. In fact, it's clear, and, and the essays in this book uh, make this point over and over again, our, our security interests, our economic interests, our political interests uh, between Europe, the United States, and Asia are deeply intertwined. Um, and so part of what I try to do is uh, work very closely with my colleagues in the government who do Asia and with my, with my uh, Asian friends to, to bring us together with Europe. Uh, I'm not going to get into today to all the details of the rebalance. I think that's what, that's what uh, Danny did for you earlier this morning. I'll use the balance of my time just to make three quick points, and then we're really what I want to do is, is engage in a dialogue uh, with all of you. Um, the first point, and it's one you would expect me to say, uh, but I have to say it's very true, which is the transatlantic alliance remains the cornerstone of U.S. security interests. Um, our European partners, uh, are our closest partners on the toughest security issues we face around the world. Uh, whether it's in Syria and dealing with the, the, the very negative consequences of the Syrian civil war and what's occurring uh, in the destabilization of all the states uh, around Syria, whether it's Iran and working with our European partners to first strengthen uh, the, the economic noose around the Iranian regime to continue to isolate uh, the Iranian regime and, and thwart its efforts uh, to develop nuclear weapons, but also as security partners uh, in the Middle East. North Africa, uh, a part of the world where from a defense perspective we have been thinking more and more about over the last several years as the security threats have been emanating uh, out of North Africa, I'm thinking in particular Mali, uh, uh, Libya, uh, uh, obviously Sudan, where our European partners uh, have deeper relationships. They have, in a, from a military sense, uh, more capability in the theater. And we, we have to work hand in glove with our European partners, uh, in many cases supporting them, for example, the French uh, in Mali uh, or the Central African Republic, but also working very closely with them on an issue like Libya, where none of us has a silver bullet answer to the security challenges in a place like Libya, but we all have a shared interest uh, in Libya's security and uh, prosperity. Ukraine. And the, the situation in Ukraine as it's evolved over the last several months serves as a stark reminder um, that there are still security threats emanating from within Europe uh, and challenges uh, uh, in the U.S.-Russian relationship. And despite the progress that has been made over the last two decades in our efforts to bring Russia uh, into the fold, we still have a long ways to go. Uh, the Ukraine crisis has shown the importance of NATO. Uh, for those of you uh, with experience in, in the mechanics of the transatlantic alliance uh, and, and working, uh, working NATO, uh, you know that sometimes it can be frustrating, it can be slow, uh, but in moments of crisis like the, like the, the last few weeks, uh, we, if we didn't have NATO, we'd have to invent it. And I think the alliance has shown its importance, its value, and the ability uh, for all of us to work together and contribute, not just in, in political statements or uh, or sort of symbolic acts, but actually deploying real capability uh, within Europe to, to reassure our European partners and also send a, re a message uh, to, our, to, our, uh, to the Russians that the Article 5 commitment, the collective uh, security commitment of NATO uh, remains strong and, and we, we remain deeply committed to that. Uh, the reassurance steps the United States has taken along with our NATO partners, for example, the, the, the bolstering of the Baltic air policing mission um, by deploying uh, additional air assets. The United States d deployed the first round of those air assets and now the British 
are following up the, the, the location or the, the placement of a ship in the Black Sea. We've had now three ships rotate into the Black Sea over the last uh, six weeks. Um, the uh, deployment of, of ground forces in the Baltics and Poland, the 173rd Combat Brigade team, 100, 600 folks sprinkled along the four countries uh, of Poland and the Baltics. Very important uh, reassurance message to our partners and the bolstering of our bilateral aviation detachment in Poland. All efforts to build up the capabilities of our allies, but also send a clear message to our allies that we are there for them and we've got their back. Those efforts are the kind of the down payment of what we're going to be doing over the next several months uh, in terms of uh, continuing to rotate forces through. And those are not just going to be United States forces. Those will be uh, NATO forces as well. But for NATO to remain relevant, it has to evolve. And that's a, been a recurring theme of the alliance since the end of the Cold War. This year is a particularly important year because of the Wales Summit uh, that will be coming in September and the inflection point that the NATO alliance uh, is facing with the transition in Afghanistan and all of the questions that that raises about what the alliance, the purpose of the alliance, uh, what we will do on the partnership agenda and the, the, how we can sustain this, this, the very strong muscle that has developed between NATO partners uh, operationally and NATO allies. Uh, and also, of course, the recurring theme we all face, uh, or many secretaries of defense have dealt with, and all of my predecessors have dealt with, which is building up uh, European defense capabilities. That's, that's a subject of a whole other conference. Uh, but I think that um, the Ukraine crisis clearly brings into the bright spotlight the importance of maintaining a strong defense across Europe. Uh, we have had very intensive conversations with our European partners over the last several weeks. Here in Washington, many ministers of defense are here this week uh, for various other meetings, and we've been seeing them at the Pentagon and obviously at the upcoming NATO defense ministerial and then the, the summit in September. A big topic will be how we collectively can build up uh, uh, our capabilities in the defense realm. Second point I want to talk a little bit about is the flip side of, of what I've just said, which is that the transatlantic relationship is, is, is the cornerstone. We still have a tremendous amount of capability deployed in Europe, and we are prepared uh, to do more. But the flip side of that is that uh, our commitment to transatlantic security, and particularly the recent focus on Ukraine, and the reminder that that has served for all of us, that we still have unfinished business in Europe, this does not diminish the commitment or energy that the administration has towards uh, the rebalance, towards Asia. Uh, our quadrennial defense review, which is a, a Every four years, the, the major strategic document coming out of the Pentagon was released uh, about a month ago. It makes very clear that the Department of Defense is still deeply committed to implementing the rebalance. Uh, you saw several years ago the first iteration of that, which was the, uh, when, when the President was in Asia in the announcement of uh, the stationing of uh, uh, some Marines in Australia. And just last week, when the President uh, was in Asia again, the, uh, the, the announcement of a very important uh, defense uh, pact with uh, the Philippines and to renew our defense relationship uh, uh, with the Philippines. The President's trip itself was a symbol that we remain very committed to the rebalance. Secretary of Defense Hagel uh, has been to Asia four times uh, in his uh, little more than a year in office. Uh, he was just there two weeks ago and, and one of the initiatives that he uh, had, had put together was a meeting of ASEAN defense ministers that we, he hosted in Hawaii to try to deepen the conversation among the Southeast Asian partners and ourselves on defense issues. I have to say, it's, uh, in my, although my current job I don't deal with Asia issues, in my previous jobs uh, at the White House and State, I was, I was much more involved uh, in, the, in the broad strokes of, of, our, uh, of our Asia policy. And inevitably in the press or in conversation, you're asked, well, you know, is the, is the rebalance being fulfilled? Are you really, is there kind of putting your money where your mouth is? And I think that, that there is clear evidence that, that we are committed. It's not just words, it's, it is deeds, as I've, as I've uh, just explained. And I do recognize that, it, particularly when you're executing a strategic move, it's oftentimes hard to see the, the impact at any snapshot in time. And that part of what our job is in government is to understand that, that even though at a particular moment it may look unfulfilled, it's how it's, what the trend line is and that where you'll be 20 years from now. And I think that what we've been trying to, to do is patiently, persistently, uh, incrementally 
uh, execute uh, the rebalance, both in terms of our, whether it's measured by visits or, or, or meetings, but also uh, from the Pentagon perspective, uh, deployments and posture. So what this means for what the book's about, uh, the transatlantic relationship, the U.S. relationship uh, to Europe. I think the, 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 the way forward is pretty self-evident, which is this isn't, uh, it's not a turning away from Europe. Uh, this, is, this is something we have to do together. Um, and we have to conduct, as the book title said, a transatlantic rebalance, <laughs> pivot, rebalance. We need to do this together. Uh, Secretary Panetta, the former Secretary of Defense, when he was, he gave a speech in London in January of 2012 at King's College, uh, where he, 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 he took this on directly. And, and, and in addition to talking about many other things regarding our transatlantic security relationship, said to our European colleagues that we need to find ways to work together in Asia. That it's, we can't measure U.S. security uh, in a zero-sum way when it comes to working with our closest partners. And, Moreover, we have shared security interests uh, in Asia, so it's incumbent on us to work together. I think Danny mentioned to you earlier this morning some ways that through diplomacy we've been working with our European partners to bring the Europeans more into the Asian conversation. And I think that uh, many of the ideas in the book, some of which uh, I read last night, are very, very good ones about things we can do differently, whether it's structuring different meetings or uh, certain initiatives to bring the Europeans closer to us with our Asian uh, treaty allies and partners. And that intensive engagement is absolutely um, necessary. Also, I'd like to say, since I think about all other parts of the world, that I think our Asian partners uh, can be more involved with the US and Europe. And it can go the other way. And I think there are many tough problems that the United States and Europe confront. I mentioned a few. Problems from North Africa, problems uh, uh, in the Middle East, and uh, Afghanistan, for example. Uh, where many Asian countries have stepped up. But I think having, the, having our Asian allies more engaged uh, in trying to deal with some of the security problems emanating from other parts of the world uh, would be important as well. Because I think one thing that's very clear is, although the United States remains the most powerful country in the world, and we have a unique role, and we are indispensable, we can't do it alone. And given the challenges that many of our European friends are facing, given the challenge we're facing, we need all the help we can get. Uh, so I'm also trying to always look for ways that I can bring my Asian colleagues more into the conversation of the challenges that I'm dealing with uh, in other parts of the world. So with that, why don't I open it up for questions. Thanks for your time. Again, congratulations, Hans, uh, on the book. Thanks. Well, speaking as a fundamental Europeanist, I'm sure glad that you're in charge of that shop. And thank you for an extraordinary introduction to uh, a set of problems which are as complicated and as demanding as anything we've had in the last 20 years. Uh, so you're in the catbird seat. Uh, second prize is you have to do it for twice as long. Uh, yes, first question over here, right at the lady in blue in the back. Thank you very much. I'm Haley Channa with the East West Center here in Washington. I'm wondering what you think that US allies in Asia can do to better support the rebalance, and specifically Japan, Korea, and Australia. To better support the rebalance. Well, I think we'd be getting, and again, this is, I will preface my remarks by saying I'm not the, uh, I'm on the other side of the, um, the bureaucratic uh, house, so to speak. But it seems to me that we, first of all, the rebalance has been, um, uh, warmly accepted uh, throughout the Asia Pacific. Uh, our, particularly the, our closest Asian partners, the, the three that you mentioned, uh, where we have deep relationships going back many, many, many decades. Uh, we have worked very well with them to sort of help execute this. I think, to me though, the, the thing I've been most struck with in terms of the rebalance is the way that we're re-engaging, or yeah, re-engaging with Southeast Asia. And that's what the Secretary of Defense was trying to do with this ASEAN Defense Ministers meeting in Hawaii. And it's not, so it's not just rebalancing within, between Asia, the Asia Pacific and the, United, and the United States, it's also rebalancing within Asia, where we're still, of course, have uh, treaty commitments and close relationships and a lot of capability deployed uh, in Northeast Asia in particular. But within the, within the Asia Pacific, there's more we can do uh, with particularly our Southeast Asian partners, which their economies are growing very fast. The security threats, as you all know far better than I do, 
uh, are, are evolving at a, at a fast pace. Um, so uh, I, I think that, that uh, we have gotten a lot of support from our longstanding treaty allies, and uh, uh, that's good, but I think also some of the more interesting work is being done in Southeast Asia. Bark. I'll, I'll, oh, sorry. Gentleman right here in the very nice blue pullover. Uh, it's Steve Winters, Washington-based researcher. Uh, I've heard uh, some uh, reports from Mongolian friends about Secretary Hegel's stop there. Uh, and uh, they told me that he suggested uh, some defense initiatives between the U.S. and Mongolia. Uh, I wondered if you could comment on that and whether that's uh, part of this concept of the pivot to Asia where Mongolia fits in. Secondly, I also hear from the Mongolians that they're quite interested in playing a role in resolving the situation on the Korean Peninsula. And of course, they did have this thing with the Japan abductees. Uh, but I have also been told that the US has been discouraging them from trying to get in as uh, joining the Sixth Party Talks. Uh, could you comment on the role of Mongolia and the pivot as seen by the US? So uh, again, prefacing my remarks by saying I don't do Mongolia. However, I can say that the secretary, um, I think he was the first secretary in some time uh, to have visited Mongolia, and that's purposeful. Uh, secretaries of defense just don't drop into places randomly. Um, and I do know that he had uh, very good talks there. I myself actually met with a Mongolian defense minister at Shangri-La last year. Mongolia is, is, again, you all know better than I do, is a extraordinarily interesting country that thinks strategically because of its neighborhood and, and, its, and uh, who it shares borders with. Um, and so, Whereas I can't comment on the specifics of the defense relationship, I, obviously it's, it's something we, we look to uh, expand or else the secretary wouldn't have been there. Uh, I also know he picked up a pretty nifty horse when he was there uh, as a gift, so. Um. Can I uh, jump in and ask you a question? Uh, this may be take beyond what you're able to say. With the efforts in regard to rebalancing plus the new concerns with regard to Europe. Do you see in terms of American force structure any stresses and tensions, number one, and two, any potential impact upon uh, uh, the defense budget? Yeah, great question. Uh, because uh, the, the, the Ukraine crisis was erupting right at the moment that our quadrennial defense review was released. So many of the questions I and my colleagues uh, uh, were subjected to on the Hill and in forums like this was, well, now don't we have to totally rewrite the QDR because of what's happening in Ukraine? And the answer is no. Uh, because many of what, m many of the initiatives and the, the policy uh, vectors that were outlined in the QDR are very relevant to how we're handling uh, the Ukraine crisis in terms of our force deployment, rotational deployments, building up unique capabilities, uh, and working very closely with our alliance partners. Our force structure has, has changed dramatically in Europe over the last 20 years. It's, it's down around 57,000 or so troops that are permanently based in Europe. Uh, and I don't see that changing dramatically. That said, we are rethinking uh, uh, some of our posture in Europe and, and the examples I, I outlined earlier of these, these small but meaningful deployments uh, through air, navy, ground assets, uh, particularly in uh, Eastern Europe. Are, we're looking to find ways to sustain those through rotational deployments. I think that, for us, feels like the, the, the future, where we, it's less about permanent uh, stationing, it's, it's rotational, where uh, forces can come in for several months, uh, do a lot of good work, build up uh, host country capacity, and then come out and other different forces can come in. Um, so I think that, that uh, uh, whereas a lot of this is under review and the, this Ukraine crisis is quite dynamic and we're waiting to see, you know, we'll this, still have several chapters of this story to go. Um, things will change, but I don't expect dramatic change in terms of force posture. On the defense budget, defense challenge, budget challenges are what they are. Uh, we feel like we have a very strong uh, uh, strategy that backs our, our, the limited resources we have. Um, Limited, but still substantial. Uh, but I, I don't see the defense budget dramatically changing as, as a result of this. Uh, thank you. One more, and let's go to this, uh, the gentleman in the back, uh, 
uh, in the gray shirt. He's a former research assistant, so he better you behave. <laughs> Park Nicholson uh, from the American Institute for Contemporary German Studies. Good to see you, Derek. Um, had a question about the report's conclusions that moved in the direction of perhaps a more globalized NATO. And if you had any thoughts or foresee any future, um, particularly in the context of potential Russian-Chinese joint military exercises or joint naval exercises in the Pacific? So, great question. Uh, uh, global NATO has been something that, that has kicked around now and then. It, every few years, an article gets written and it kind of comes back to the fore. I don't see that being uh, something that, that is coming back you know, in terms of a, getting traction as an argument anytime soon. The partnership agenda, which is, it's not global NATO because it's not membership, but the way that we, as the NATO Alliance, works closely with those capable partners who in Afghanistan are stepping up, for example, in an incredibly meaningful way. In some cases, uh, far more meaningful than many of our NATO allies are stepping up in terms of uh, the, the amount of force they're putting in the theater, the willingness to take risks, and the casualties they're suffering. So I think w one of the ideas we're playing with as we lead up to the Wales Summit is how we can structure our partnership agenda, so NATO's, NATO's closest partners, how we can structure that agenda uh, where they can, we can work, continue to work closely with them even if it's short of membership. But I don't, I don't see there's, that there's much appetite for uh, bringing, either on either side, either a country that's very capable like an Australia, that's a terrific partner, wanting to be in NATO, nor uh, the NATO alliance coming around to wanting full membership for Australia. Okay, with that, I want to thank everybody uh, for your time. Sorry it was short, but good luck for the rest of the day. Thanks. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary, for uh, taking your time and giving us uh, some insights that we're not going to be able to get anywhere else. Thank yeah. you very much, and good luck. Now over to Heather. I'm sorry? Uh, I can be in the middle. Sure. All right, after that quick switch, uh, on to our second panel discussion, Understanding the Transatlantic Dimensions of a Trans-Pacific Century. Again, uh, for those who may have joined us a bit late, my name is Heather Conley. I direct the Europe program here at CSIS. I have to say I was so struck by uh, the first panel, and particularly Victor Cha's comment about uh, uh, looking at the institutional development of Asia. And I'm struck because as I look at Europe and Asia, Asia, two things uh, they have in common, unfortunately, a rise of nationalism and uh, historical <clears throat> grievances that are yet to be fully addressed, and certainly President Putin represents a a very significant historical grievance. But the institutions were, the, uh, were what uh, tried to temper both of those, uh, the European coal and steel community, which evolved into the EU, the economic dimension, the OSCE dimension, which of course also has the economic and the security, but the third dimension, the human rights, the rule of law, uh, and then of course NATO as the security uh, ability. It's striking that over the last 25 years, the conflicts that have struck Europe and the Balkans, Georgia, and now Ukraine have happened outside that institutional structure. So those institutions are so, so pivotal. We have a phenomenal panel discussion uh, to talk about understanding both, both dimensions, uh, the European approach to Asia and the Asian views uh, about Europe. And so
So joining us first is Ambassador Michael Schaefer, who is now currently chairman of the board of the BMW uh, Foundation, uh, uh, but a uh, career dip diplomat, uh, a fantastic colleague to many of us in Washington from his time as German ambassador to Beijing, but also as uh, German political director. And then we have our colleague Rem Korteweg, senior research fellow at the Center for European Reform. Uh, and again, uh, both Ambassador Schaefer and, and Rem uh, are uh, contributing authors to the book. And then following that, we'll have uh, Tim Borsma, fellow of the Energy Security Initiative uh, at the Brookings Institute to help us uh, understand the energy uh, dimension resources uh, in Asia. And then we'll finally turn to Dan Hamilton, who will be, he'll take us from the opposite view, the Asia, Asia's pivot to the Atlantic. So with that and being very mindful that we have a lot to cover in an hour, uh, I'll, uh, I'll stop and turn to Ambassador Schaefer. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Heather. And maybe before I go into a few more specific uh, points that I would like to make, um, let me make some general remarks. I think uh, I'm grateful to Hans Binnendijk that he has uh, reminded us that this is not only about a transatlantic pivot to Asia, but it is about building something new, and that is a trilateral understanding which would include and has to include Asia. And I think our discussion has been a bit short in the Asian perception of what both the US and, and Europe are doing. Secondly, I think we all agree, despite um, what's going on in Ukraine uh, and, and Russia, um, what we will see is a continued uh, engagement, not only of the US, but also uh, of the European Union uh, in Asia, no matter if we call it a pivot or rebalancing uh, or whatever, we will do both and we will do it uh, in a very engaged way. And that means that um, we have to be careful that this does not get into a zero-sum uh, equation. All of our speakers this morning have taken it for granted that this is not a zero-sum game. But I think, and to put a little bit water into the wine, mm -hmm. this is not a foregone conclusion. Um, we have seen a relatively high level of trust between decision makers in Washington, in Brussels, in Germany, in most of the European countries. But what we also see is a dramatic shift uh, in trust, uh, a diminishing trust in Europe as far as the US is concerned. And if we talk transatlantic, uh, so to say, cohesion, we must not lose sight that this is a trend which I think is worrying. I've been 45 years in the transatlantic business. Uh, I'm extremely concerned about these more popular uh, uh, developments. And I think if we talk uh, cohesion in our policies uh, towards Asia, I think we need to understand what this is all about as far as our transatlantic starting points are concerned. I was in the uh, Trilateral Commission meeting uh, from Thursday to, to Sunday, and it was really interesting to see that everyone is taking it for granted that we are an alliance of values. Well, first of all, uh, I think personally we are. Secondly, we have lost sight of many of the layers of this uh, alliance of values. And that is something, if we go to Asia, and I will comment on that a little bit more specific later, um, this is something we cannot take for granted. It started with Iraq, but Guantanamo, Abu Ghraib, the NSA conflict, which we do have, show that we look at certain value issues differently, and we need not you know, overplay this, these differences in our transatlantic relationship, I think this is extremely important if we want, so to say, to have cohesion uh, between us. I would also say we are not only an alliance of values, basically I, I agree with this assessment, we are also an alliance of at least partial interests. And I think if we look towards engagement in, in Asia, 
We need to understand where our interests do not converge and where we have convergent interests. I mean, commercially, we are all competitors, but that's true for the European Union as well. Our companies are competitors. Uh, we do have uh, different interests. But I think it is important to identify where we have converging interests as we go into the Asian continent. And I would like to try to highlight very few parameters which go beyond what other colleagues are discussing, I, the economy, the security issues. I think we largely agree on these issues. I would like more to look into the soft uh, power of it, and because that is uh, one area which I think is, um, is key if we want to build what we call trilateral partnerships. Trilateral partnerships will mean that we do not just bring in the US and the EU interests into the region. We need to take into consideration legitimate interests and legitimate, so to say, perceptions coming from the Asians themselves. And that is the starting point for me. Our acceptance that Asia must define its own way of development based on self-interest in the first way, not based on Western interests. That may be difficult to accept for some of us, but I think having lived in Asia for many years uh, during these last years, this is a key point for we, we must accept that they define their own uh, legitimate interests. Second, it is true, as uh, Mariam van den Heuvel uh, said earlier, uh, Asia is not China. That's true, and that's a truism almost. But, Asia, uh, uh, but China is the most important single uh, actor. And it is of key importance that the European Union and, uh, and the US try to reach an understanding as to China's development. Uh, this is a, a very important thing. Of course, we can, at a very superficial level, uh, agree that it's not exclusion, but the inclusion uh, of China uh, into the developments of, the all, uh, of, of all of Asia. But what does it really mean? Um, we need to appreciate not only uh, the opportunities which the Chinese market is offering to us, but we also need to come to an understanding what the risks are. We need to have a threat per perception which is, to a large extent, congruent. I think this is lacking uh, very often in practical politics seen, uh, we are not talking about the differences in our threat perception, uh, but that uh, may, may be key. The third comes from there. Um, the objective, and our colleagues have talked about it in the first panel, the objective obviously is to integrate China and the other Asian players into um, an international system which already exists. But it is not static. It is dynamic. It will develop. TPP has been discussed. Uh, many other legal developments will follow from this. Now, it is quite important to understand that while we expect that all of the Asian countries, including China, start from the existing legal system, we must also accept that in building new elements to this legal system, they will have their legitimate input at eye level. That's a level playing field which we need to accept. It's not an octroi that the US and the EU are going to do in Asia because they are not going to accept it. Not only China, the other Asians won't, won't either. If we ask ourselves, and that is my fourth point, which is the most important converging interest that we have. I would say it's stability in Asia. That may sound like truism, but it's a very complex and, and difficult statement. It consists, apart from what already has been discussed, of three major elements. First, we need to see that stable domestic developments are taking place in the various Asian countries. Secondly, the building of a fair framework for the integration of the Asian economies that has been already discussed. 
Thirdly, and I will only touch shortly uh, on it, it's the aspect of reconciliation because I think it is key for solving any of the territorial conflicts or many of the other um, uh, larger conflicts between, in particular, the East, East Asian countries. Let me share just a few elements with you on the first point, domestic stability. And I take China as, as an example. I know it best, but it is very true to many of the other Asian societies as well. China, in many ways, is a positive and negative role model for the neighboring Asian countries. It has had an unprecedented positive development, I think unprecedented in recent human history, but it's now at a crucial turning point. Urbanization has been too fast. It has been uncoordinated. It is not sustainable. The, the gap between rich and poor, between uh, a rising middle class and, uh, of 350 million and the same number of people at the poverty line is, is going to be of a big conflictual potential in, in China. The cost of environmental uh, destruction is enormous. The corruption is endemic. I just list a few of these points which are extremely Im an important challenge for the Chinese government in the next years to come. They are confronted with a frustration level which rises from day to day. There is protests in the streets. Most people don't know about it. More than 190,000 demonstrations with more than 500 people every year. That is not reported in our media at all. The social media have become what I would call a post-democratic form of participation, putting enormous pressure on uh, municipal, on provincial, on the central uh, government. And the two key challenges which this government is facing clearly is making the growth, which has been enormous, but making it sustainable. That has been discussed already in the first panel. I'm not going to dwell on it. But the second is social justice. Uh, to me, building social justice is the litmus test for stability uh, in China. And that, of course, is at the core building uh, rule of law. Now, we always take it as if any society would automatically develop rule of law. Nothing could, could be wronger than this statement because most East Asian societies don't have a tradition. Confucianism and the, the resulting order of not only China but most of the East Asian countries has not known the rule of law that we have developed after the era of enlightenment in Europe and then eventually in, in, in the US. We take it for granted that rule of law, of course, means good laws, educated lawyers, independence of justice, and the trust of the people in the law. None of these four things is existing. They are building now good laws because we help them to do so. There are only 120,000 educated lawyers in China. How many do you have in, in Washington? 80,000, probably. And that's, and that's for 1.4 billion people. Uh, they don't have people who understand the law in administrations, in courts, nowhere. It will take 20 to 25 years to have an adequate number of people you know, who understand what they're talking about. And then obviously, the independence of the courts means loss of power by the Communist Party. Now this is, again, a very key uh, element. Will or will not they give up at least parts of, of their power? If they don't, they may lose all of their power. So they have to calibrate this development. And this is a process which is extremely tedious, will be very long, it will probably go for more than a generation or so. And this is something our societies are not ready to take. We want to criticize these countries, rightly so, for human rights violations. But we have, don't have the patience in, in trying to accompany these processes in building rule of law. 
That is something which, which we need to reflect about because it is, it is one of the essential uh, processes which uh, probably we will have to, to uh, accompany. What is true for China is true for most Asian societies. There is very, very widespread lack of respect for human rights irrespective of their political system. Because in most countries, either you have no rule of law or you have no effective rule of law. Autocratic China and democratic India, let me put it really bluntly, uh, are struggling with social justice because there is no functioning law, although the formal framework for law exists in India. Let's not, so to say, overlook these, these elements because then we don't get it right in, in building uh, a trilateral uh, a partnership with the Asian countries. If we want stability in Asia, we need to support the building of the rule of law without double standards. We have to, to, to understand that a spade is a spade, no matter if, if human rights violations, if corruption, if, if other, so to say, obstacles uh, to the legal uh, implementation happen in, in autocratic systems or in democratic systems. If we don't respect this principle, we are not going to have the, so to say, the authority to really uh, ask these societies to, to, to develop in the same way. Something which is very often overlooked and I think uh, needs to be reflected. Good governance is key, not ideological victories if we want stability uh, in these countries. Uh, now my last remark is um, we, um, we, we need to, to uh, understand that um, uh, with the, the development of rule of law, this of course is not only true to the societies proper, but also dealing with the, the uh, conflicts and, and problems uh, these neighbors have with each other. Uh, again, unlike Europe, unlike the transatlantic relationship, the host of, of uh, legal instruments is rather uh, thin. There is not the understanding that I have the same kind of, so to say, set of, of instruments which help me to overcome issues. Take the territorial issues between um, Japan and, uh, and China, Japan and Korea, China and, and uh, the South uh, China Sea, Philippines uh, issue. Um, I, I'm concerned about the potential uh, of, the, of the conflict, not because I think these countries will engage in aggressive policies. I'm much more concerned about um, the unintended escalations which uh, lie in, in these conflicts. This is true in particular to the Senkaku DAOU uh, uh, conflicts where I think both sides understand that it would be a disaster uh, for both societies to engage in, a, in an open conflict. But the potential for conflict is enormous. Now, if you, we have heard discussions on how to deal with it, be it from the US, be it from the European side. Now, I don't think this is a question of formal arbitration structures. Yes, we all would like to see uh, that this goes without a uh, threat of, uh, of violence, uh, that this goes in a diplomatic way, but we need to understand, and this has been discussed shortly in the morning, we have to understand the underlying uh, problems. Now, there is, so to say, historic conflicts between China and uh, and, and Japan, which will not go away. Why won't it go away? Nanjing, and Nanjing has been mentioned, is a thorn in the flesh of every Chinese person. You go to any place in China, and people, no matter where they come from, how much they're educated, they're very, very much, so to say, concerned about this, this historic element, which now goes back 80 years. 80 years in the 1930s. Now, nationalism 
in China and in Japan will not easily go away uh, if these underlying historic problems are not solved. So I think it is correct. I don't know uh, who said it in, in the morning, but it is extremely important that somehow we try to reflect how to assist uh, these, these uh, societies to go about their reconciliation. The problem which I see is Germany and, and France after the war started on a new footing. Germany was, so to say, completely destroyed, but also our system had changed completely. There was no Nazi regime anymore. And de Gaulle offered, offered his hand to Germany as a strong partner to, to allow for reconciliation. Now, that does not happen in, in Asia. The, the Asian leadership, the Japanese leadership, structurally, functionally, is still the same. The, the house of the emperor is still there. There is continuity, which makes it much more complicated to, so to say, go into these issues of reconciliation. And that's why, that's my last word. I would say it is important that we engage not governments, but science, civil society, young people, in order to try to bring about this kind of, of uh, readiness for reconciliation, which over 20 years have helped us with France and Poland uh, to do what was necessary to do, and which was the key for building the European Union. Thanks. Thank you, Ambassador Rem. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about Europe's approaches to Asia, and particularly the ability of Europe to develop a common or coordinated strategic approach to uh, Asia, and particularly the Asia Pacific. Um, and I would like to frame my comments with, uh, in the context of what's happening with Ukraine. Um, there's good news and there's bad news when it comes to the development of a coordinated strategic approach by Europe to Asia. First, the good news. I would say that 2012 was a high water mark when it comes to Europe's pivot to Asia. We saw an increased amount of visits by European senior officials to the region, participation in the Shangri-La dialogue by uh, HRVP Catherine Ashton, um, senior European leaders visiting the region and uh, building diplomatic ties. We also know in 2012 the, at the ASEAN Regional Forum, Secretary Clinton and uh, HRVP Ashton signed a common declaration in which they decided to pursue greater strategic cooperation in Asia. And um, a, a, a guideline document was adopted by the European Union on uh, guidelines for its foreign and security policy towards East Asia. Um, that's the good news. The bad news is that in the past two years, not that much has happened. The EU is still very much divided in its approach to Asia. It's primarily economic and primarily bilateral. Very little on security and um, very little to no real strategic engagement with, uh, with Asia, in spite of the fact that Europe has so -called, four so-called strategic partnerships with Asian countries. Um, and I think that first, uh, if you'd asked me this question uh, six months ago, I'd point to the Euro crisis as being one of the main factors why Europe can't get its act together. Now I'd point to what's happening in Ukraine. Ukraine is really focusing Europe's attention away from the region and on its immediate neighborhood. And I think the long-term strategic consequences of that are worth bearing in mind. Now, I think at the same time, along with all of my other colleagues today, it would be a strategic error if Europe does not keep uh, uh, its eye on the ball, to use another basketball expression, um, and doesn't continue to pursue uh, not only a security focus, but in, in general, a strategic focus on, uh, on the Asia Pacific. Um, and why is that? And, and I, uh, forgive me if I say some things that have already been mentioned today, um, but I think it's worth recalling the enormous economic interest that Europe has in, in, in the Asia Pacific. 27% of EU's global trade is with, uh, with East Asia, which is more than the trade with North America. Um, it means that Europe has a fundamental security interest in continued stability, uh, as Ambassador Schaefer said. Freedom of navigation, maritime security is, is pivotal um, to continued economic uh, growth in, in, in the world, but especially also in keeping Europe's ailing economy on track. Um, developments in the DPRK in North Korea 
uh, are, are of interest to uh, Europe, not only because of its, uh, uh, its interest in nonproliferation, but also the impact that that would have on global, global trade flows coming from Asia towards, uh, towards Europe. Just a statistic, um, every year 5.6 million containers are transited through uh, the port of Rotterdam, and 30% of that passes through either the South or East China Seas. I mean, it's, it's a very clear uh, relevance that, uh, that, or a very clear interest that Europe has in, in continued stability. Um, secondly, I would point to the transatlantic relationship. A lot has been mentioned today about that, so I won't dwell on it too long, but the relevance of the transatlantic relationship requires Europe to, to, to pivot together, or at least talk to and try to coordinate with the United States about Asia policy. And it touches upon a broader issue about what kind of actor Europe wants to be. Does Europe want to be only a security consumer, or does it also want to be a security producer? In 2003, uh, the EU security strategy said that Europe wants to be a global actor. If it wants to be a global actor, it needs to participate on, uh, on, on uh, sort of developing the, uh, 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 the Asia-Pacific security architecture. Um, furthermore, I, and I think this is worth bearing in mind, uh, Asia's rise will lead to overlapping interests with Europe in places elsewhere than the Asia Pacific. So we see increasing engagement of Asian partners in North Africa, uh, in the Middle East, the projections of the amount of oil that's going to flow to China from the Middle East um, is, is, is going to require Europe to, to continue to engage with, uh, with, uh, with China on, uh, on energy security. Um, relations in the Arctic involve uh, both Europe as well as Asian partners. So there's a real necessity to have a strategic dialogue with, um, with Asia from a European perspective. Uh, finally, uh, in, more in the short term with respect to some of the territorial and maritime disputes, my sentiment is that Asian allies are also growing, in, growing increasingly impatient with European stalling or ambivalence or neutrality when it comes to its position on some of the, uh, the issues that, uh, that have emerged there. Uh, there's been a lot of um, um, sort of uh, grumbling in, in Japan about uh, weak responses to um, uh, the declaration of the AIDS. Uh, at the same time in Beijing, people weren't very happy that Catherine Ashton didn't speak out very firmly against the visit to the Yasukuni Shrine. There is a potential that Europe really becomes divided as it as it doesn't create a, a, a coherent, coordinated approach to what's happening in Asia because of um, the fact that these Asian countries see a real vital security interest in what's happening there. And they look at the Europeans and they say, well, it's all a little bit wishy-washy. It's, it's neither here nor there. It's very neutral. It's impartial. How long can that be sustainable? Um, and uh, finally, uh, there are a number of global problems that require Asian solutions. We've talked about climate change, or we will talk a little bit more about climate change, also resource security, energy security, really have a very strong Asian dimension, not to mention um, nonproliferation. So what, what can Europe then, then plausibly do? Um, and I think as a bottom line, we need to appreciate that Europe has an interest and a capability to contribute to shaping the context for a peaceful rise of Asia. And um, that means strengthening multilateral governance, uh, trying to uh, uh, co contribute to building a cooperative security architecture. I mean, this is basically diplomatic speak for saying, let's focus on ASEAN and see how we can really beef up that, or that organization. And this is where the EU has a lot of, of tools and a lot of lessons learned that it can share with ASEAN. Um, trade, trade has been talked about before in the previous panel. Just to mention, it's not only about TPP and TTIP, although I think it would be very useful if in Europe we have greater understanding of the geopolitical importance of both of these agreements. Too often in Europe, I hear people say, well, TPP is sort of a, a, a free trade agreement 1.0. What's really the big game in town is TTIP. So as, as Europeans try to compete for Mike Froman's attention, they also try to make that zero-sum case of let's focus on TTIP first and then perhaps TPP, because TPP is very difficult, isn't it? And we need to get beyond that. Um, at the same time, Europe is also uh, pursuing a lot of bilateral free trade agreements that I think we need to, we need to uh, be aware of, because it 
creates this possibility of a really a, a, triang a triangle of, of free trade agreements with Asia, not only TPP, TTIP, but also a potential EU-ASEAN uh, free trade agreement, and it, it is a real tool of influence to pursue what, the, uh, what is a West or transatlantic common interest in setting the, the terms of global trade. Um, it's been mentioned by Ambassador Schaefer before, but just to reiterate, Europe has uh, lessons to share and expertise to share on how to deal with historical reconciliation. It's not necessarily governments, it's mostly academics, uh, universities, people-to-people -people exchanges, but it's something that governments can definitely encourage. Um, and then uh, the elephant in the room, what can Europe do militarily? And indeed, not a whole lot, but there are a couple of things. Um, maritime security, if it is so important to Europe, and I believe it is, um, we should do what the Brits have done last year. Uh, the UK sent a, a frigate to Southeast Asia to make port visits, to participate in exercises in the region, and to basically show that they cared, so to build military-to-military -military relations. Now, I would venture, why um, don't we have a continuous European frigate in the region to build relations, to have exercises, to show that Europe is also concerned about maritime security, uh, whether it's from a counter-piracy perspective or whether it's from a, um, a, a, uh, a simple military, military to military building trust perspective. Um, at the same time, security sector reform, conflict prevention, sort of the, the things that we know that the EU can do, or NATO in terms of missile defense, uh, is all very much worth, uh, worth pursuing. Um, how can Europe do this? And uh, in conferences like this, we often despair that Europe can't speak with one voice. And um, I'm going to jump on that bandwagon and say, yes, you know, Europe should speak with one voice, but it's not realistic. We're, it's not going to happen. The reason is that bilateral relations between European countries and Asian countries are too important. It would be like saying that the UK, France, and Germany defer to the EU in all their relations with the United States. It's, it's simply not going to happen. But what we can do is to coordinate much more strongly and leverage the different channels that individual European countries and the EU have vis-a-vis -vis Asia. Just to give a couple of examples, Germany has arguably the best relations with China among European member states. Why don't we use that? The UK and France have the only security or slash military presence in the region. Rather than asking the, Ger the, the, the Germans and the French and the UK to defer to the European Union, why can't we ask the external action service to try to coordinate what is in the broader common European interest and ask these individual countries to push that agenda in their individual relations? And there, in that way, the EU can act as a force multiplier. Let me end with just a couple of concerns I have with respect to Ukraine. Ukraine, I think, will be a watershed moment for European strategic thinking. Europe may start to take hard security much more serious because of uh, what's happening on its eastern border. But at the same time, it will continue to focus Europe only on its neighborhood. And that's a real problem. The Ukraine crisis is also absorbing European attention away from Asia-Pacific issues, creating another opportunity for the EU to be divided by, for instance, the increasing diplomatic tensions between Japan and China. And it's something that we have to be really aware of. And finally, the European inability or unwillingness to avoid the dismemberment of one of its neighboring countries is not sending the right signal in terms of credibility building vis-a-vis -vis the Asia Pacific and engaging with them in a very credible fashion. So I'd, I'd, uh, perhaps I'm ending on a somewhat pessimistic note, but I really think that um, we need to have that discussion how Ukraine and, uh, and the Asia Pacific uh, match or don't match. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ren Tim. Thanks, Heather. Uh, good morning to you all. Thanks, thank you all for being here. Uh, first of all, I want to say a special thanks also on behalf of my co-author, Prince uh, Jaime de Bourbon Parm. Uh, to uh, Johns Hopkins Center for Transatlantic Relations, of course, and the, uh, and the Dutch Foreign Ministry for making this book project possible. Uh, I, for one, have learned a lot from the conference we had earlier in The Hague and uh, my new colleagues and, of course, the discussions we had on these various topics. Um, I will give a very short overview, and it's really going to be a brief overview of, uh, of our chapter, which deals with the natural resource competition and the environment. Um, Chaim and I have looked specifically at the cases of energy and mineral resources, uh, both in the United States and Europe. And, uh, and we've asked ourselves whether current trends suggest that the transatlantic alliance may uh, at some point come under pressure 
as global demand for, uh, for resources is predicted to dramatically increase in the coming decades, and with the vast majority of that increase occurring outside the transatlantic space in, uh, in non-OECD countries. Uh, so we observe the following. Uh, due to reasons that I think are known to most of you, uh, to some degree, the United States has become an, an important uh, global producer of both oil and natural gas. And, uh, and in the coming years, we will see uh, to what extent that country may even turn into a net exporter of those of energy resources. Um, Europe, on the other hand, is increasingly dependent on energy resources uh, and outside suppliers, um, struggles to a great extent to integrate its full market, uh, uh, internal market, and effectively create an attractive environment for, uh, for alternative suppliers to compete with traditionally dominant suppliers such as Russia. Uh, due to a range of incidents, uh, EU and Russia have been, uh, have been drifting apart, and this started far before, far before the Ukraine crisis occurred, of course. Um, uh, even though I, th I do think that, uh, in my view, there's not really a realistic scenario in which uh, Russia is not an important supplier of energy resources to the European Union. Uh, as the situation in Ukraine further escalates, it seems only a matter of time, uh, the way I see it, before Russia turns east and south, where it will find significant alternative demand in, in those earlier mentioned uh, non-OECD countries. Um, in terms of mineral resources, the, uh, the United States was always one of the larger uh, producers in the world of minerals, including several rare earth materials. Uh, due to high labor costs and strict environmental regulations, uh, most of the processing capaci capacity for those minerals uh, had moved to China throughout the years, and mines in the US had closed. Uh, following a series of supply disruptions and subsequent concerns within both DOD and DOE, uh, both the U.S. Uh, and the European Union, which is also largely dependent on external suppliers, uh, have started an initiative to promote renewed domestic mining uh, to, to more diversity of, uh, of, uh, of supplies, substitution, and increased recycling. Uh, as it will take roughly 15 years to re reinstall the entire mineral supply chain, uh, for the time being, the United States and Europe seem to be in the same boat on this front. Uh, Jaime and I then look at uh, the rise of Asia in terms of resource consumption and production, uh, and focus, of course, particularly on China. Uh, we note that there are a number of misperceptions about Chinese investments abroad, uh, and that the, uh, the role of its companies in the global market sphere is not always well interpreted. Uh, moreover, we think, and the ambassador alluded to this earlier, that the deterioration of Chinese air and water quality and the increased domestic protests suggest that there may be limits to China's research foray and consumption domestically. Uh, we describe this in more detail, and of course, I would encourage you to read the chapter and the book for that matter, if you're interested to read more. Uh, we end the chapter then by identifying uh, areas of cooperation, not just between the United States and Europe, um, but also including China, India, and other important countries in the Asian sphere. Some examples are sharing best practices to stimulate responsible extraction of unconventional energy resources, which we have not even started with or hardly started with, uh, collectively investing and developing renewable energy, uh, technology to enhance energy efficiency, uh, and carbon capture and sequestration technology, which we will really need if we for a minute consider that coal is gonna rival oil as the dominant fuel source in, uh, in about uh, 2017, 2018, uh, China and, and India, by the time being the, the dominant pr uh, consumers of that coal around the world. Um, most importantly, I think, however, we should collaborate to reduce resource consumption, and I don't think we've even started to really work on that, including this part of the world. Um, in terms of mineral resources, we've been, we have to move beyond the scam monitoring of, uh, of Chinese investments abroad. Uh, in addition, transatlantic partners, we think, can further stimulate private sector initiatives uh, to develop alternatives for critical minerals and enhance recycling. Uh, in the run-up to, uh, to the next climate conference in Paris in 2015, we think that the EU and the US should minimally embrace the binding 40% carbon emissions reduction target for 2030, as was recently proposed by the European Commission. Finally, and most urgently, however, and this is, and this is not in our chapter, uh, I think that transatlantic partners may reconsider including countries like China and India uh, and, and others in an effort to de-escalate the crisis in Ukraine. The often suggested isolation of Russia is in fact not happening, and the sanctions lack teeth, most importantly because they would equally hurt Europe and to a less extent the United States, something that's been alluded to before. It is time to acknowledge this and collectively work on an alternative. Thank you. Tim, thank you so much. Dan, we have a couple of minutes and I'd love to get a couple of questions in, okay. so we'll wrap it up. Okay, uh, <laughs> that's a great introduction, thank you. 
Uh, <laughs> Dan, you understand what I'm doing. You do it uh, all the so, time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, my, uh, you know, uh, my chapter is, is the counterintuitive chapter intentionally because it seems that if we, if Atlantic powers are considering how and why and whether we should pivot to Asia, it's important to consider that and understand that Asia is pivoting to the Atlantic. And uh, so it's not just about how we together engage in the Asia Pacific region, but how we together should understand the broader dynamics of Asia's rise, and that includes uh, here uh, and in the broader, uh, what I would call the Atlantic Hemisphere. Uh, Kishore Mahbubani wrote a book a few years ago uh, about the, what he called the Asian Hemisphere. Uh, and that's the rise, that's gonna be the, you know, the new century. Well, just by definition, if there's an Asian hemisphere, then there's an Atlantic hemisphere. Uh, and by definition then, what my definition of that hemisphere would be the four continents of the Atlantic. So it includes not only the North Atlantic, but also Latin America, Caribbean, and Africa. And so what this chapter does, I'm not gonna bore you with the details, I tried to map uh, to the extent possible Asia's rise and it's now its presence in the Atlantic Hemisphere uh, in all sorts of different ways, uh, North America, Europe, Latin America, and Africa. So uh, if you're interested in that, I encourage you just to read the chapter because it gets into some details, which I'm not gonna get into. I think the basic point is that there are some real trends here that are uh, bear looking at and they have some implications uh, back to the United States and Europe. Uh, one is that, you know, the, uh, there are very diverse motivations of Asian countries engaging in, in the Atlantic, uh, and, and each country has its own. Uh, there are uh, un important underlying trends that, are, that we need to keep in mind and bear on our own relations, each of ours, with Latin America and Africa. And if you could sort of summarize some of these, if you look at the details, you see the primary driver of Asian interest is still economic. Uh, it's though somewhat different. In the South Atlantic, it tends to be more an interest in resources, energy, agricultural commodities. In the North Atlantic, it tends to be access to consumer markets, uh, innovation, uh, technical know-how. Uh, and the form uh, that each country takes, Japan's presence obviously is very different than China's. Uh, Korea is increasing its presence everywhere. Uh, and it, it's just a very interesting, uh, diversified uh, picture. So it means that the influence of the Asian economies is really still economic. There's political influence that comes from that, but it's very uneven and not quite as significant. The second, I think, thing you see is there's no real coherent strategy to this. Uh, each country is, has its own approach uh, with more or little real attention to uh, all uh, this part of the world. Uh, and that uh, Asian countries tend to be as much competitors in their Atlantic uh, engagement as they are at all uh, cooperative. And you see that, in fact, they're, in many cases, they are exporting their intra-regional competition to the rest of the world. Uh, and I think that has implications uh, also for us. Uh, and, and they also take different approaches, of course, to issues of human rights, rule of law, the things Michael was talking about, as they engage in other countries elsewhere, including in the Atlantic. I think what you see, though, if you look at that, it's not only that Asian countries don't have a coherent strategy, the US and Europe don't have a coherent strategy either to what I would call the Atlantic Hemisphere or certainly the South Atlantic. And by look, taking the prism of Asian engagement, you see issues that have been neglected by the US and Europe. You see areas in which we've withdrawn our engagement, and you also see some uh, future challenges. Um, the other element that you see is that it's not just what I, the continents I talked about, but the Arctic, uh, because Asian engagement now in the Arctic is actually uh, growing. We have to think about that. Also the Antarctic in a different way. But there's another sea, ocean, if you will, developing in which there's a new regime developing that includes Asian influence. Um, their impact in the Atlantic is also important in a global sense in terms of worldwide norms and standards. How we uh, want to advance those standards is not only about how we engage in Asia, but how we work together uh, in the Atlantic. And I think it also it helps us with some perspective because sort of this breathless talk of Asia's rise, its global rise, you get some caveats if you look at what's really happening. It's not, it's very uneven. There are some thick links now, but they're very thin links still. It depends on the countries uh, that you want to talk about. And in mo almost all areas in the Atlantic, 
Asian presence still lags significantly behind uh, U.S. and European presence, despite anecdotes you might hear. So the conclusions, you know, in my, in my piece is we shouldn't just turn to the Pacific, we should harness the Atlantic. And we think about our own connections and those of our other Atlantic partners because they, each of us are being influenced by Asia's rise. We need to keep that in mind as we look at that. So, um, and, and that it, the more we, are, uh, we get our act together at home uh, and have our own vibrant economies, the things we work together, the more confident we're going to be in terms of strategic outreach to Asia. I think Rem even mentioned that. It, if, if you're absorbed by your own problems, you simply have less space to engage with your partners on er other things. The other is to understand what's happening, that globalization is not just about the Pacific. All the connections between continents that are happening in the Pacific, Asia Pacific, are happening also in the Atlantic and do other ways. And, and one needs to really keep that in mind. We have a whole project called the Atlantic Basin Initiative, this is my short plug, with the paper that kind of goes through those trends. We have 60 maps that new, now map the new Atlantic. And I think it's important to keep in mind that those trends are also happening. It's not just one part of the world that's the new dynamic. Um, so the, the one that's critical and shows this Atlantic Pacific is energy. We talk in the United States as if the energy revolution is just happening here. It's happening everywhere in the Atlantic hemisphere. If you go all through, uh, down mm -hmm. south, not only Canada, but down through Gulf of Mexico, Mexico, South America, it's uh, transformative. You go to Africa, it's a transformative energy revolution that's happening. And it's not just fracking unconventional fossil fuels, energy innovation is also very much an Atlantic phenomenon. That's where Europe is playing a huge role. If you take biofuels, my colleague Paul is here, so I'm parroting his, uh, his material. Uh, you know, 85, 90% of the biofuels are traded and consumed in the Atlantic. So if we're gonna go to a second generation biofuels regime, it's an Atlantic conversation, but it'll have huge impact, all of this on the Pacific, because the Pacific will be the consumers but the energy is going to be the energy reservoir, uh, the Atlantic is going to be the energy reservoir of the world over the next decades. And they have huge implications back into the uh, Pacific. Uh, so I think in terms of just the technicality, the diplomacies, you have differentiated dialogues. It's not only about building in uh, conversations, the US-EU dialogues about China, it's building into the US-China dialogue a conversation about Africa or Latin America. Uh, and that, I think, is Michael's point. We need to talk about this together in a much bigger sense and not these sort of narrow uh, senses. So, and I think if you look at Asian uh, architecture and approaches, one last point I would just say is, I think it's actually useful to be open to good practice that comes from the Asia Pacific region when we think about how to engage in the Atlantic. And one very clear example is an APEC infrastructure partnership regime that exists. So through, through APEC, there's, a, I think, a fairly creative way, private sector, public sector work on infrastructure. Uh, that's exactly right now the issue facing uh, Africa, Latin America, uh, and it's exactly the area where the US and Europe could actually add some value. If we had a framework, and actually Asia Pacific provides a kind of framework like that. So there are ideas that we can transfer this way. We don't always have to think we're taking our ideas the other way. Thank you. Dan, you punched a lot into eight minutes. Thank you so much for that. This is, we need to have further discussions. Okay, I, I've come out of this conversation. Volume two is the Arctic and how to unpack the environment, the economic, the institutional dynamics of the Arctic Council. I raised my hand for that book. Uh, the third volume, I think, uh, and Rem, you raised this, is really about how the crisis in Ukraine and this new dynamic, how it impacts uh, trilaterally. I have to say I have probably uh, spoken more to Asian diplomats, Chinese diplomats in particular, about what this crisis means to the international system. Uh, I've heard some voices in Europe suggesting that if we push Russia too hard, this will force Russia and China into a condominium against the West. We have to watch how all these dynamics. So I've got projects lined up for everybody for a, a very long time. Uh, we have literally two minutes, so we're going to have a lightning round. Uh, are there any very focused, specific questions to any of the speakers that you'd like to throw out now? I'm going to just take the woman in the back because she hasn't had a chance to do a Q&A. And ma'am, if you could identify yourself and keep Keep it so short, thank you. 
A question for uh, Ambassador Schaefer on China. Um, you made a reference to uh, the Confucian tradition and the absence of a rule of law in China's history and even China's neighbor's history, et cetera. As uh, sort of someone uh, who, uh, who considers herself a, a descendant of that uh, Confucian tradition, I have to say that totally absent laws and the rule of law, the Middle Kingdom would not have lasted more than 2,000 years. I mean, to the degree, the degree to which laws and the rule of law in particular are observed under the cur current government is debatable. So uh, my question is, uh, you mentioned each nation, you know, they should go down, they will inevitably define their own path, I mean, based on um, the their own interests. I mean, full credit to that. But in terms of, uh, uh, if we look at the picture of Asia, and with uh, China in particular, um, the, the term they is a very complex plural. So how do you address the friction, say, between the street and the government? Thank you. And, and Ambassador Schaefer, if I can say that I know this is a conversation that you would be delighted to do after lunch in a longer perspective. If you can give us the 30 second response, thank you. Uh, it is complex. I, I didn't want to say that there has not been any kind of flaws in, in, in the society. What I wanted to say is our, uh, so to say, uh, system of rule of law as we have developed it in the Western world is, is not what we, uh, or, or what most Asian societies have experienced. My, my hope is that as in Taiwan, as in Korea, as in some of the democratic societies, rule of law has started to develop. There is, so to say, a chance of building on these experiences. Uh, and some of the stones, the stepping stones, will be the traditional legal uh, experiences uh, also existing in China. But what I wanted to say is what we call rule of law uh, with a system of a legal system, which is a judicial uh, system, uh, which has, uh, so to say, developed in Europe in the last 250 years is inexistent and has never uh, existed in, in China. Beautiful. Now, stay right where you are. We're going to invite Ambassador Chris Hill to do a keynote that Dan's going to introduce. I'm going to excuse the panel, and you're going to thank them for a fantastic presentation. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I'm really uh, delighted to introduce uh, Chris Hill. So Chris is one of our authors. He and Michael Schaefer actually co-authored our piece on really what do, you, what do we need to do. So I really recommend that chapter because it's very focused, two very experienced uh, practitioners uh, collaborating, uh, each of whom have had a tremendous experience uh, uh, in both Atlantic and, and Pacific realms. You have Chris's bio, but I, you know, it's really quite amazing. Besides now being the dean of the Corbell School in, in Denver, so uh, also affiliated with our broader association of, of, of uh, schools of international affairs. Um, I mean, Chris was the assistant secretary. He had Danny, Danny Russell's job uh, that uh, you've heard from him, uh, you know, ambassador to Iraq, Korea, Poland, uh, Macedonia. I remember visiting him when he was in Macedonia, you know, going over the hills trying to, uh, you know, it was quite a time. Uh, Chris was at the White House. Uh, he, uh, as everyone knows, totally involved, uh, really an architect of the Dayton uh, peace agreements. Uh, we worked together in, in the State Department. But my, my, really, my personal story is uh, we got together because our wives were linguistics students. Uh, and that we knew each other in a completely different, we were sort of the tag-along spouses with a Norwegian friend of ours, uh, and they would, the wives would sort of shuttle us off in the kitchen and they would need to talk about their stuff, and we started to have our own debates about uh, all sorts of crazy things uh, many, many years ago. And then when Chris was a uh, officer in Poland, and I was living in West Berlin at the time, uh, there were certain walls up at the time, uh, and uh, they were going to give birth, uh, the, and the next U.S. medical facility was in West Berlin. So they had to come to West Berlin to have the baby delivered, and they stayed with us uh, during that time. So that, that was a fun time. I think uh, Papa was a little nervous, uh, but uh, it was great. It was a different world, I tell you. But uh, it's, it's really fun and, and just wonderful that, Chris, you could join us and be with us and participate in this project. Chris Hill.
thank you very much, Dan, and it's a, it's a really a pleasure to be here uh, back in Washington, D.C. It's not quite Denver, Colorado. I guess when the, uh, you know, when we have a sunset, it's behind the Rocky Mountains. When you have a sunset, it's behind Roslyn, Virginia. Um, I guess it's, uh, this is a bit of a difficult appearance for me because I, I'm the last uh, speaker, or I'm the uh, speaker standing between you and lunch. Um, and I'm also sort of proof of the aphorism that uh, everything has been said today, but not by everybody. So uh, here I am. Um, it is really, though, I, I think a, a great pleasure, a great honor to participate in this uh, project. I was very honored to work with uh, Michael Schaefer on our on our chapter on the on the diplomacy. I cannot think of a more um, timely, really, moment to uh, to discuss this issue of the. Euro-American uh, pivot to, to Asia. Now, I must say, uh, that too gives me some uh, mixed emotions because it sort of implies that uh, the United States have not discovered uh, Asia in the, um, in the past. And I do remember making a few trips there uh, a few years ago. I think uh, Victor Cha will bear me out on that. So um, it's not so much uh, rediscovery of Asia, but it is, I think, a, an, an understanding that uh, we are in really a new, uh, a new period. I mean, it was only 25 years ago, exactly 25 years ago, that uh, we were in something that was dubbed the, uh, of the New World Order, if you can remember that expression. And uh, now, uh, thanks to this uh, crisis in, in Ukraine, really a, a sort of retro crisis, if you will, I mean, some of the elements of things you have, we haven't seen in a long time, uh, I, can, uh, I think we're in a new kind of period now, and I think we need to define what that period is. Um, you know, one of the things we're looking at at the Corbell School is whether the term international studies really is what we're talking about. We're really talking about something that's more global than international, it involves not just governments, but also NGOs. It involves a lot of, uh, of uh, different sort of networks and so I think when you're looking at something like the relationship uh, with Asia, you can see that there have been some networks that have been you know, heavily involved with Asia in a way to, to some extent where governments are merely catching up with those, uh, with those networks. So I think uh, it is an important time. It's a very important time in our uh, uh, mutual security uh, uh, endowment of, of NATO, of our, uh, the transatlantic relationship, to be really looking more globally. And I think to some extent, um, we both have had to kind of uh, retool a little for an understanding of what, uh, of what this uh, Asia means for us. Now, I think with any new uh, initiative of this kind, I think the uh, Obama administration was quite correct to kind of focus on this or make this a, a major a focus, but I think with any um, uh, with any new initiative, it has come with some unintended consequences, and I think we are dealing with some of those unintended consequences uh, together. And perhaps in dealing with those, we can further our joint project, really, of a pivot. And one of them, of course, is what this what this uh, volume intends to deal with, which is the notion that the pivot to Asia did not mean a diminution of our uh, transatlantic uh, relations. I think to some extent, uh, uh, Mr. Putin has helped us uh, really uh, rekindle those, uh, those ties and to be thinking about what we need to do uh, together because it is not so much a Ukrainian crisis, it is a Russia crisis. That is the big issue for the next, uh, uh, for the next quarter century. It is not about you know, Ukraine, God bless them, they will go on with their political crises as they have in their first 23 years. The real question will be how we manage this, uh, this new Russia. Will it be a Russia that somehow is in the deep freeze uh, in, in the future? Will it be a Russia that somehow reemerges in a kind of Asian context as well? Uh, so I think the question of how we manage Russia will, will uh, I think in a funny way, kind of back into uh, how we, um, how we are managing issues in, in East Asia. 
So I think the, so dealing with this unintended consequence of, of, of uh, European, uh, of the transatlantic ties, I think we have really begun to address that. Um, but I think a second unintended consequence, of course, has been in the Middle East. Now, to some extent, it was an intended consequence because I think the Obama administration really wanted to show we're out of the bombing of mud huts era and we're into an era where we look really at our long-term interests. But I think to a great extent, we may have failed to understand the broader issues that are going on across the Middle East. Um, I think Heather Conley talked about nationalism. In fact, several of the speakers have talked about nationalism. In the Middle East, it's called sectarianism. And this sectarianism has really inflamed uh, the entire region. It's a sectarianism between Sunni and Shia, but it's also a sectarianism among or within the uh, Sunni community between secularists and Islamists. This is a very serious matter. In the past, in the Middle East, you had certain adults who stepped forward, like Egypt, and Egypt would say, you know, we've got to calm this down, and Egypt would kind of figure out, the Egyptian diplomats would kind of figure out how to work with uh, uh, other, you know, moneyed interests in the uh, Middle East, and they'd kind of calm it down. Well, there aren't Egyptian diplomats running around anymore uh, on this issue. Turkey took a stab at kind of taking the leadership uh, role in the Middle East. But, uh, you know, you don't have to be a student of the Ottoman Empire to know that not every Arab is thrilled with having a recreation of the Ottoman Empire. So I think the Turks had certain limits in what they could do. And so then it becomes a question of who else is stepping up. Uh, those people who believe that somehow China would be the kind of emerged uh, superpower surpassing the U.S. After all, this week, China's GDP may have surpassed the United States. I submit to you, and we'll get to that in a second, that uh, China has problems the likes of which uh, we have no idea. You know, when uh, when uh, Xi Jinping looks at his, uh, at his inbox in the morning, it is not an inbox that anyone else would want to look at and then try to have breakfast. Uh, it is replete with issues. I don't think China is really quite ready for global responsibility or addressing the, uh, the problems in the Middle East. So I come again back to the issue of could the U.S. and Europe maybe do a little more, and yet you get the impression that we've been completely distracted uh, from the Middle East. And I raise in particular the issue of Syria. Now, there are those, and I remember this very well from Bosnia, there are those who say, well, those Syrians are just going to have to work it out themselves. There's nothing we can do to help them. Well, I submit to you, we've got to be engaged on that because that is a problem that has metastasized. There are those who want to say, well, you know, Iraq's problems are all caused by this grumpy uh, uh, prime minister named Nouri al-Maliki, and maybe he'll be voted out of office. Well, maybe he won't. And moreover, I would suggest to you, as difficult as, as Maliki may be as a prime minister in Iraq and as uh, unpleasant as he may be from time to time. I, I often say that if he ever had charisma, it cleared up a long time ago. But uh, <laughs> we need to understand that what is happening in Iraq is a broader issue coming out of Syria, and it reflects this whole sectarianism. And so the notion that somehow the U.S. was going to pivot to Asia and uh, get away from the Middle East. We can't be getting away from the Middle East any more than we can be getting away from uh, Europe or frankly any other uh, part, of the, uh, part of the world. I think we'd need to be engaged in these problems, but I'm hopeful that really this pivot that we talk about more as a reattention to Asia can also be a reattention to the transatlantic relationship because I think the transatlantic relationship is the key for dealing with these uh, kinds of uh, kinds of issues in places like the Middle East. I'm of the view that um, as um, similar in some people's minds as the Syrian crisis may be to the Bosnian crisis, it differs in one very important respect. In the Bosnian crisis, we had something called a contact group plan. We, we had broad, broad participation of the Europeans, not just Britain and France, but much broader participation. And we had an Ameri America there, Russia was there, the United Nations was there, 
and we worked out what the future political arrangements should be of, um, of Bosnia. Should it be a, uh, should it retain its uh, uh, existing borders? Should it be a kind of federalist state? What sort of structures should exist in Bosnia? This sounds a little paternalistic, but on the other hand, when you've had a war in your country and you have killed upwards of 200,000 people, you have no right to be telling people don't be mater uh, paternalistic. You need to submit yourself to some, uh, to some effort. And so I think the, uh, the US and the Europeans and the Russians, for that matter, did a pretty good job of kind of laying out what the future of, uh, future of Bosnia is going to be. I fear that with respect to Syria, we've had a sort of notion that Assad must go. But even if Assad is hit by a bus uh, today, you are still going to have a question of what those future political arrangements should be. And I think the US and the Europeans especially need to be more engaged in that project. And in a kind of funny way, I hope the enhanced engagement that we will get from this pivot will actually allow us to uh, be enhanced in other parts of the world that have allegedly been kind of left behind by this pivot. But I think the third, um, the third misconception, or unintended consequence, I should say, and I'd like to pick up on, on uh, my co-author's points about this, is what has really happened to our perception of China in this pivot. For example, um, I think the administration, and by the way, it is so, uh, uh, how to put it, uh, refreshing not to be an administration spokesman anymore and to actually tell you what I really think. Uh, but I do believe that this administration had almost as many problems with the pivot rollout or the rebalance, they couldn't even agree on the name at the time, almost as many problems rolling out the pivot as they did rolling out health care. Uh, for those of you who aren't from the U.S. and didn't follow that, don't start now. But uh, the first thing they did, of course, is we had the uh, Secretary of State go to uh, uh, go to the Philippines, and she was on a warship in Manila Bay. We haven't done that since Admiral Dewey, and uh, announced uh, a new sort of uh, re-engagement of the Pacific of the uh, Philippine-U.S. Uh, security agreement. Perfectly good news for the Philippines, but I can tell you it didn't look so good over on the other uh, on the other side of the uh, of the water. That is in in China. So then secondly, we had our president announce that we were going to send some uh, Marines to do some training exercises in Australia. Makes a lot of sense, has nothing to do with China. Just look at a map, you can see it's a long way from China. Nonetheless, that was perceived as some sort of additional effort vis-a-vis -vis China. To me, one of the most bizarre, but at the same time, one of the most welcome developments was when the president said, we're going to send our Secretary of State to Burma and start kind of getting, uh, figure out how we can have a, a positive relationship with Burma. Very positive stuff, in my view, but it was couched in the US media as being still a third element of what really became, from a Chinese perspective, as some kind of encirclement of, uh, of China. And um, but a lot did. Um, I must say, in China, uh, zero-sum thinking, unfortunately, very much prevails, especially in security uh, circles. We have a little of that here in Washington as well. Uh, so I think for many Chinese, they looked at this kind of effort in, uh, in the, in the uh, South China Sea. They looked at the uh, Australia. They looked at uh, uh, Burma. In fact, frankly, they've looked at the whole rapprochement with, uh, with India as being some kind of encirclement of, of, of China. And so I think the overall, the, the gist of the pivot, and I think it, which is something that uh, Michael and I tried to argue away from, the gist of the pivot has been that somehow it's a China containment policy. And uh, I don't think that's going to help anybody, and I think that has to be corrected. This is not to say that China has not uh, uh, created a lot of problems on its own. I was in, um, during the, during the uh, second Bush administration, I had to endure the uh, constant uh, 
uh, opinion pieces in the newspapers about how China was actually far better, had far better diplomats than America did. After all, the Chinese would go to places like Indonesia and their head of state would stay there for a couple of days, whereas we're lucky if we can get our head of state to stay 45 minutes in a particular country before he has to go on to another country. This notion that the Chinese had their diplomacy together while the Americans couldn't really figure it out uh, in fact, I think in the fullness of time, China has had a lot of problems in managing its relationships in Asia, a lot of problems of its own making. I think the uh, South China Sea is a problem that uh, China didn't have to have, and yet China, I think, very much stumbled into that for a lot of different uh, different reasons, but again, having to do with this scourge of nationalism, which is not just in China, it's everywhere. So I think in China's efforts to declare the South China Sea a sort of southern Chinese lake uh, in this effort to the, the so-called Nine Dash Line, I think they created a lot of problems uh, in Southeast Asia. I was in the Philippines uh, recently, and to hear the Filipinos uh, refer to China as a bully, which to me is a kind of warning sign to the Chinese that somehow they better fix these relationships. But getting back to Xi Jinping's uh, inbox, when he looks at that inbox uh, and the mountains of problems he has, fixing his relationship with uh, the Philippines is probably not on the top of that inbox right now. And so I think we have to understand that China, like many big countries, is beset by its internal problems, and sometimes those internal problems become external problems. So I think it's for us, really, uh, Europe and America to be engaged here, but I think we need to be engaged in a way that it is not perceived as somehow a containment strategy against China. Uh, I think one of the very positive aspects of the pivot was the effort to uh, uh, work much more closely with Southeast Asian uh, nations. Uh, I think there was a sense from some of them that we were, not, uh, we were not paying enough attention. I think our efforts to pay more attention has been very, have been very positive. But I think we need to be careful not to allow our politicians to turn attention into East Asia, East, uh, Southeast Asia as an effort to contain China. I think for many Americans, when they look at these international issues, we look at them too much in terms of a kind of um, a zero thinking, and in particular, this notion that somehow China is out there to displace uh, uh, the United States in particular. I think there is this uh, kind of uh, notion, in fact, you hear a lot of Americans today who cannot spell Peloponnesian, nonetheless talking about the Peloponnesian Wars and the idea that somehow this is about uh, uh, the established power and the rising power. I submit to you these people don't know a lot about ancient Athens or ancient Sparta, but they need know even less about contemporary China and contemporary uh, United States. So I think we need to be very careful that in our greater attention to Asia, we do not bring with it this kind of negative energy. China, to be sure, is going to have to uh, figure out its future, its relations with these neighbors. But I think we should cut the Chinese a little slack in the understanding that China's history with neighbors is not a history, a uh, sort of uh, history in a Westphalian uh, tradition. It's a history with a tributary states. These are difficult habits to break. I have no doubt that China will be able to break them break these habits, but I also have no doubt that it is a difficult uh, process for China to be managing these relations. Finally, I would like to say, though, about China, and this goes up into the northeastern part of, uh, uh, of, of Asia, and that is, uh, it is one thing to have, um, to have problems, maritime problems, with, with neighbors. Uh, just about everybody has time problems, maybe with the exception of Switzerland and Hungary and a few other uh, landlocked countries. But uh, so it's one thing to have maritime problems and to be sure there needs to be some effort to deal with these problems in the form of some sort of greater institutionalization, greater multilateralization of, uh, of Asia, uh, more places to park these problems until uh, uh, tempers can uh, can be reduced, more efforts to try to deal with, you know, create economic 
structures that can uh, begin to deal with these problems in a 21st century way rather than in a 19th century mercantilist way. I mean, there are, there are ways that I think uh, can be, uh, can be uh, uh, employed to deal with these issues. Uh, the code of conduct, for example, the ASEAN countries have, have, have uh, uh, proposed. China needs to understand that the ASEAN countries are very proud of the structure that they've, uh, they've formed together and therefore are, are interested in talking to China uh, just individually. And I think the Chinese need to be a little more clever about that. When, someone, when something's important to someone, you shouldn't just ignore it and say you have to deal with them in a different way. So all of those uh, maritime issues, and especially some of these code of conduct things and these issues of keeping ships from bumping into each other, I think are, I put in the doable category and the explainable category, because as I said, there are many maritime issues around the world. What I think is something China really is its continued relationship with North Korea as somehow an element of the future equation in Asia because North Korea as it is presently constituted is not a country that uh, any country should really want to be closely associated with. I think China has uh, tried to do things, but I think China is very much held up by this zero-sum thinking, this notion that if North Korea collapses, uh, that somehow this will be a victory for the United States China. I think they need to get over this kind of uh, zero-sum thinking and maybe think more in terms of the win-win of that. I think it was very positive for China to have this, uh, uh, to host uh, uh, Park Geun-hye uh, last, uh, just a year ago, uh, last June. I think that was very positive. Ironically, many Chinese think that somehow this is uh, putting a finger in our eye, that somehow if China has a closer relationship with South Korea, this will bother us. On the contrary, the pattern of cooperation we're looking for in the region. And I think the, the more the Chinese and the Republic of Korea can work together, uh, the better that relationship will be and the better our relationships will be with those, with those countries. So I think China really needs to rethink that uh, relationship in North Korea. They're clearly rethinking it, but they clearly haven't formed a consensus to move ahead on that. And I think that too is something that our, uh, our European and U.S. efforts Finally, I, Victor Cha spoke very eloquently about the issue of, uh, of the, the history in the region, the fact that this history really bedevils the U.S. and the, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, bedevils these uh, ROK and Japan relationships. I do hope that those can be improved. I do hope the U.S. has a role, but I certainly believe that Europe has a role. And uh, it is not to say that uh, we should be lecturing the uh, Asians on uh, uh, institutions and uh, thinking that we've achieved in, on the European side and the European and the Atlantic uh, relationship, but I do believe that some of these uh, some of these successes in Europe are truly applicable uh, to Asia. People always talk about, well, Asia is complicated. You have enormous countries and small countries. Europe actually has a little of that, too, if you look at the size of Germany and the size of Luxembourg. So I think uh, some of these things, uh, some of these problems can be addressed with some of the solutions that the Europeans have found over uh, what, um, what is uh, now some uh, 70 years of post-war uh, post history. I'm very optimistic about uh, this transatlantic relationship. I think uh, this, uh, this idea that we need to pay more attention to Asia, we need to somehow rebalance our efforts toward Asia, I think is a real opportunity for enhanced dialogue in, in the Atlantic. The European security role in Asia, what should be a kind of um, broader economic uh, uh, approach in, in Asia with the United States. I think all of these things argues for uh, a little better future than we've uh, than this immediate past. And so, um, as we contemplate the problems ahead, certainly the problem of uh, of uh, what Russia is intending to become. Will Russia try to become an Asian country? Will Russia try to enhance it? 
now that it's uh, been pretty much ostracized, and for good reason, from uh, the uh, self-ostracized, I should say, from these Euro-Atlantic structures, where will Russia be? So I think it is a, a very important time uh, in, this, uh, in this year to be talking about this pivot to Asia and what it means for our broader security and broader economic interests. So thank you very much. We're, uh, we're all standing between ourselves and lunch, so, uh, but I do want to give a chance for some uh, questions, but I'd like to just, again, bunch them so we can, uh, Chris can just take them uh, together. Yes, right here. Hey, please say who you are, so, Chris. Uh, Steve Winters, uh, local researcher. Uh, you mentioned uh, that uh, China's uh, uh, tradition of tributary relations, and then you also uh, contrasted that with the Westphalian system. But uh, you often see the comment that we're really moving the whole concepts like R2P, right to protect, and the Bosnia situation don't fit in with this uh, Westphalian system. In the meantime, China, you know, has suggested uh, or come out with various slogans or whatever, new uh, pattern of great power relations. Uh, since the whole thing is in flux, uh, is there anybody who's listening to, seriously to any of these Chinese suggestions for uh, the way the global order would develop? Yeah. Because I don't see any sign of that. Yeah. Let, let me just take a couple of, so Chris, so you can, right here, yes, right here. Uh. From uh, China's perspective, it, was, it is because of America's military presence and other presence in South Asia. China feels like, okay, you are here, you are messing up with, our, with my neighborhood. That's why we couldn't do better. And uh, from an American perspective, it's because China cannot do better that America is there. So there's a difference, you know, perspective perceptions there. And how do you think, you know, both sides have this kind of a little zero-sum game thoughts. And yeah. um, how then, uh... Thank you, Ambassador. My name is Chi Ning Wen with Voice of Vietnamese Americans. I thank you for mentioning uh, Southeast Asian and ASEAN into the big pictures. And so I come back to the main focus that we talk about the global norms and global rules of law and the 21st century standard in many different aspects, yeah. trade, military, and everything else. So would you suggest that this pivot from the transatlantic pivot set of norms in many different aspects? Yeah. Thank you. OK. On this first issue of the, uh, the sort of Chinese notion that you know, the great powers ought to get together and sort these things out, uh, I think, as your question implies, this has nothing to do with what we're talking about in terms of 21st century. Uh, um, interestingly, remember the G2 idea, um, which was kind of an American olive branch to the Chinese, hey, we're going to, you know, really was perceived all that well. And uh, I think we have to kind of think about those things. Uh, before we uh, talk about those things. Thinking before talking is a very old-fashioned concept, but I think it ought to be uh, tried now and again. Um, I think one of the problems, one of the persistent problems, is that China believes that many of these sort of global ideas, uh, these uh, sort of um, global values are desiderata, its own um, national desiderata, globalize them in international structures. Um, I don't think that's true, uh, but I think it does reflect the fact that we live in a networked uh, world now, and I think China should be un able to understand that, which is that when our NGOs suggest something or when our, uh, you know, some, someone from our civil society wants to do that, that In a, something in its editorial page, it is not reflecting the U.S. government. And I think that has proved to be, at times, an elusive concept for the Chinese to understand, even though they've got a, some of it going on in their own country. So I think we need to um, uh, be a little careful about those uh, kinds of things. The, the second um, point was about the uh, Southeast Asia. Um,
two of us there. And uh, uh, I can remember uh, as we were looking at uh, uh, European Union membership in, in Central Europe, there was all this talk, is this going to mean more uh, you know, that the U.S. will be crowded out of Central Europe and somehow we'll lose our relationships with countries like Poland. I was ambassador at the time, and so I kind of tracked those issues. And uh, I Europe didn't mean less of the United States. And uh, it, uh, to me, it can be worked out very well. And I think the Chinese, for those Chinese who see it in those kinds of zero-sum terms, that somehow we're more uh, uh, visible in Southeast Asia, and therefore uh, this is a threat to Chinese interests, that is kind of old think. And uh, I think the Chinese need to have some fresh to me to hear Chinese say, well, if uh, North Korea were to collapse, somehow this w we'd have U.S. troops up on the Yalu River and we'd have CIA listening posts on the Yalu River. You know, that is the last thing that will probably happen. We will have far more difficult time convincing our Congress to keep any U.S. troops on the Korean Peninsula after North Korea says goodbye to the rest of us. So. Uh, uh, Yet there are many people in China who believe that this is all about a U.S. effort to somehow encircle China. And I know we have Americans who say things like that. I mean, but we also have Americans who believe the moon is made of green cheese. It doesn't really mean anything. Uh, the, what really means something is what is our overall policy? How do we regard China? Uh, one of the nice things about living outside of the Beltway uh, and to live in a place like Colorado is the amount of positive feeling people have toward uh, toward China generally as a uh, as a civilization, as a uh, as a place that everyone wants to go visit. Uh, it is not seen as this sort of throbbing security issue that I think uh, many people here and. Uh, consider it. So I think uh, it's really something where um, China needs to calm down, and maybe we need to calm down a little, but uh, I think China certainly needs to understand that uh, uh, we need good relations with Vietnam, we need good relations with the Philippines, we need good relations with all these countries, and they need not come at the expense of uh, their, their relationships with China, however ch they choose for those China, uh, relations to be. And then the third question then was sort of a global I wasn't uh, about ASEAN. I mean, I think um, ASEAN is the kind of multilateral structure that we need to see more of in Asia. I feel that sometimes the ASEAN way uh, has been a little too self-limiting, and I think ASEAN, uh, ASEAN countries could do more. For example, we. Um, talked about having a, uh, I remember the Singaporeans had a tabletop exercise on some sort of maritime security. Maritime security turned into a cosmic theological discussion of who is sovereign between these 10,000 uh, Indonesian islands. Very complicated stuff, and it never, this tabletop exercise never took place. I tried to have a, uh, an exercise, because I saw this in the Partnership for Peace in Europe, where one time I was in Poland up in the Baltic Sea and I was looking at U.S. Marines in a, in a Russian landing craft arriving in Poland, setting up some hospitals for some nat natural calamity. So I thought, why can't we do that in Asia? Because after all, there are natural calamities happening every other week in Asia. But the amount of bureaucratic impediment to that within ASEAN, in short, ASEAN was so self-limiting and uh, so unnecessarily limiting. By the way, we eventually did the exercise, but it was more a search and rescue exercise where we took one helicopter in Manila Bay and dropped some hapless uh, uh, Filipino Marine into the water, and then some other helicopter went and picked him up. I mean, okay, it was a start, but uh, we could do we could do a lot more, and I think ASEAN is absolutely the place to start, and there are plenty of others. ASEAN plus three, there's the uh, East Asia Summit. You wouldn't have believed the problems we had convincing people in this 
city about the need for membership in the East Asian Summit. I mean, I had to deal with issues like, well, if we join the East Asian Summit, we'll never be able to criticize the Burmese junta again. And I said, yes, we will. Uh, you want me to prove that? I can get up and denounce them the day that, the, uh, East, that we accede to the East Asia Summit. We have our own little problems with, uh, with these multilateral structures, but ASEAN really uh, needs to step it up and uh, not unlike uh, uh, in the life of an individual, uh, they, they really need to understand that uh, you know, they can do better. I think you